Total War Three Kingdoms asks you to become one of 11 legendary warlords and unite China under your banner. I'm going over each starting warlord to reveal who they were historically and how this has been adapted to the game. Today's warlord is Liu Bei. When the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel was written about this turbulent period in history, Liu Bei was chosen as the hero. The virtuous idealist who started with nothing and created an empire founded on his steadfast dedication to bringing out the best in others. As part of the Liu family, his branch was a distant offshoot from the ruling Han Emperor. Liu Bei was born a peasant, supported only by his mother, and his family supported itself by cutting straw from the fields and weaving it into sandals to sell at market. Knowing that the boy was destined for greater things and that she could not provide that future, his mother leveraged his family name and put him under the care of a distinguished scholar to better himself. Concise in speech, calm in demeanor, and kind to his friends. Not particularly clever or skilled, but his dedication was unparalleled and won the hearts of anyone he met. And he never forgot his roots among the common man. When the Yellow Turban Rebellion began, Liu Bei followed his ambition and called on the local lords to support him in forming a peasant militia to join the government forces. It was during this time that Liu Bei met the men who had become his sworn brothers. Zhong Fei, a butcher with a booming voice and a brash personality who thrives in a brawl. Stubborn and prideful, he'll never turn his back on an enemy and is easily goaded to a fight. Guan Yu, the mountain bandit who stands a head taller than anyone around him, yet walks with a calm nobility. Arrogant, but always willing and able to back up any of his boasts. This motley crew of outcasts saw the uprising as a chance to prove themselves and gain the noble recognition denied them by birth. So before they set out, they swore an oath in a peach garden to save the troubled and aid the helpless, avenge the nation above, and bring peace to his citizens below. And though not born on the same day, they hoped to die so. At the game's start in AD 190, the Yellow Turbans have been crushed, and the coalition to defeat Dong Zhuo has faltered. Liu Bei finds himself in command of a peasant army with no enemy to fight. You'll begin his campaign at the edge of Dong Province, with his brothers Guan Yu and Zhang Fei in your retinue. Remnants of the Yellow Turbans still surround them, so his initial challenge will be to break through these. As the Han Empire collapses, Liu Bei wants to save the dynasty by rooting out rebels and corruption. But first, he needs a power base to recruit more warriors. You'll have to deal with the local rebels and reinstate law and order. But from there, the alliances you choose will dictate your path forward. Even though Liu Bei hails from a line of emperors, he rose from humble beginnings and does so in the campaign as well. Compared to the other warlords, his starting position is fragile at best. Though due to his imperial ancestry, many see Liu Bei with more legitimacy than any other faction leaders, and this allows him to confederate with other warlords earlier than most factions. Of all the warlords, Liu Bei has the strongest bonds with his starting characters, his sworn brothers Zhang Fei and Guan Yu. Yet, because of his lowly status, Liu Bei is only able to recruit one army at the start of the game. Only after he has established himself can he field more forces to expand his territory. But to begin with, at least, it's safer to play Liu Bei with a low region count and focus on strong governance. Liu Bei's strength is derived from those closest to him, so he must maintain unity and cohesion within his faction. Only by leading a tight-knit band of brothers will Liu Bei be able to emerge victorious from this conflict, and this unity acts as a resource for his faction, so you will need to be doubly vigilant to ensure his followers are satisfied and happy. If his unity remains strong, Liu Bei will progress through the faction ranks faster and gain bonuses to better government, like fielding extra armies and assigning more governors. The unity can also be spent to bolster satisfaction of his generals, or to annex territories under control of the Han Empire without a fight. Liu Bei is popular with the masses, and as long as he leads your faction, his militia units have their upkeep cost, making it easier for you to maintain his forces early on, and he also brings a boost to public order across his realms. Liu Bei's initial dilemma centers around Tao Xin. Tao Xin had allegedly killed Cao Cao's father, Cao Song, but Tao Xin of course denies this. Cao Cao declares war, and Tao Xian turns to Liu Bei for help. You can refuse, or you can join the conflict and fight the difficult war against Cao Cao. But if you repel the attack, Liu Bei will have proven himself as a leader of worth, and when Tao Xian dies, his followers will offer to join Liu Bei, confederating all of his lands into your own. 
Historically speaking, Liu Bei spent 20 years wandering the links of China with his brothers, gathering some of the greatest men of the era to his banner, so that it's often actually unclear how much of Liu Bei's success can be attributed to Liu Bei. His life is recorded as a maddening cycle of serving under a warlord, gaining recognition, and then losing it all, only to restart again from nothing, fighting for Gong Sun Zon, taking over Tao Xian's empire, and then taking Gong Sun Zon's best general, fighting against and then alongside Yun Shao, fighting against and then for Cao Cao, and then against again, fighting for Liu Bao, and then taking over his province for himself, fighting alongside Sun Xian and then against him, inviting Lu Bu to serve him, only to be betrayed by him and then having to fight him too. Liu Bei switched sides as needed in an ever-changing sea of loyalties far too complex to detail here, all the while hemming and hawing over whether or not he was making the righteous decision and being a good man that serves the people. Liu Bei was the Jon Snow of ancient China. And it's only after Liu Bei was tricked, cajoled, betrayed, and nearly killed multiple times that he finally rises above his pride to reach for a grander goal and learns to play the political game. While nursing his wounds under the service of yet another warlord, this time Liu Biao, he hears of a great scholar and strategist. Realizing that his plans alone are no longer enough, Liu Bei seeks him out. And in Zhuge Liang, he finds the one man who can channel his positive intentions into an actual strategy of reuniting China. By the time the two meet in AD 207, Cao Cao controlled nearly all of northern China, and without a coordinated assault, he would soon control the entirety. Called the Longzhong Plan, it required Liu Bei to create his own power base out of Jing and Yi provinces and make friends out of Sun Qian for a two-pronged assault back into the north. Liu Bei would get his chance at the Battle of Red Cliffs, but first he would gain and lose yet another fortune. Jing province had thus far avoided the war under Liu Biao's rule and became prosperous under his governance, so Liu Biao wanted no part of this. But if Liu Bei wanted to fight Cao Cao, he would need those lands. It's astoundingly coincidental that the moment Cao Cao marches into Ji province, is the same one that Liu Biao mysteriously dies, and Liu Bei takes command. And this is a frequent undercurrent to the story of Liu Bei. The Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel, based on oral tradition, paints him as the underdog hero thrust into the limelight, while the historical sources hint at conspiracy and ruthless skullduggery. Personally, I'm willing to give Liu Bei the benefit of the doubt, and I'm inclined to believe he had the best intentions. Because as Cao Cao marched south into Jing province, Liu Bei led an exodus of more than 100,000 peasants fleeing before the warlord's fury, slowed down by women and children carrying carts of all their worldly possessions. And when Cao Cao caught up with the slow-moving troop, Liu Bei refused to leave them. Zhuge Liang's plan to defeat Cao Cao and retake the north required an army and Liu Bei to still be alive. But Liu Bei refused to save himself. And at the Battle of Chang Ban, while performing a rearguard action to protect the people, his army was wiped out. But even in defeat, the people of the south again sought out Liu Bei to lead them. He had not forsaken them in their hour of need, so they would not abandon him now. And after many battles, he would finally reclaim their lost lands and at their urging, declare himself a vassal king in service to the emperor founding the kingdom of Shu Han, one of the eponymous three kingdoms. So what kind of player is Liu Bei for? Liu Bei is the choice for someone who cares about the people and tries their best for them, even though they may fail. Who seeks to bring peace to the land, but not at the cost of their honor. And knows that even in defeat, you can still rise back up and gain victory. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to learn more about the Warlords and Total War Three Kingdoms, you can find their videos on this channel.